Welcome everyone to our uh, keynote presentation this morning. Um, our speaker is Jay Santos, uh, PE principal for facility dynamics engineering. Uh, Jay's firm, uh, Jay's been in this industry for probably more than 40 years. Um, it's not an industry that he intended to enter, but circumstances, life, led him there from his engineering background. Um, his company has mostly focused on commissioning and retro commissioning, which is where uh, the design intent that starts out the construction process, ultimately the rubber meets the road and, and um, the term commissioning means different things to different people and um, it can mean just turning on the equipment in the most crude sense of commissioning. And of course, uh, a firm like Jay's has a very different uh, understanding of, of what commissioning is. And, and the industry as a whole, I think, looks at commissioning as a very, very important part of the, the value stream of getting the building into occupancy and operations. And Jay's I've known Jay for more than 10 years. He was, his firm helped uh, Laney College develop its BAS lab, actually designed the lab installation and commissioned it. Uh, so uh, Jay's perspective comes from lots and lots of experience. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce him and, and get 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 the uh, get this panel go or this session going. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Um, it's always uh, enjoy uh, working with this particular group in particular because I do have a, an education uh, a bent background, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, consistent for me. So I enjoy working uh, with the folks at what you're doing on the technical education, especially in the controls arena. Okay, um, I want to get uh, talk a little bit about um, the title. Of this is is uh, is my perspective to persistence in operations. So um, my goal here, um, again, my educator, you know, what's the goal is I want to give everyone a little different perspective, um, and my focus is persistence. Um, as Peter said, I've been around in this business for about forty four years now. So. Um, you know, we we all have our, our backgrounds, which creates our perspective and, and biases as, as, as such. So in the last decade or so, um, I'm really, you know, I get focused on persistence um, uh, and somewhat frustrated and the lack of persistence, I guess, would be a, another way to look at it. Um, so what I want to talk about to give you a little bit about my background, so you know where I'm coming from, I'm talking about uh, Constantly in my career, I've been involved in energy conservation efforts in various uh, ways, and now through commissioning and retro commissioning with an energy focus. Um, controls design, uh, a lot of background there. Um, and, and then that led me to commissioning and retro commissioning, which is kind of what we practice more than anything right now. Then I want to talk to get to the, to the main point of what I want to do is persistence and how do we motivate it uh, better than we're doing right now? And then I have some questions, discussion, thoughts, and it's not a discussion format here, but uh, hopefully that'll uh, give you some some thought processes. Again, the goal is to is to create some some thinking here that's a little bit different than uh, uh, traditionally uh, on how we um, approach this. Um, so my background and my perspective, my bias. So started as a design engineer in the military. And this was during the 78, 79 timeframe, which was technically our second energy crisis. Now I remember our first energy crisis, 73, 74, because I was starting to drive then. And I was very aware of, uh, of gas going from 30 cents a gallon to 55 cents a gallon very quickly. Um, the second energy crisis, uh, we were kind of experiencing, if I recall, 20% increases in, in electric rates on a year over year basis. Um, and our, my focus as I was a mechanical design engineer was, you know, so we needed to focus on energy and it was an extra duty. It was something we 
I did in my spare time. Um, and so that was my first exposure to energy engineering uh, at an installation. Um, there was no fund, there was no, uh, not a lot of money to invest in it at the time. It was really just, you know, operate things differently back in that time frame. Um, as Peter mentioned, I, I was not, I, I spent my whole military career trying to get out of facility management. You can see how successful I was. Um, but the one thing that intrigued me was the HVAC and controls arena of HVAC design and systems, I was intrigued by the controls. Um, and in a way, I was intrigued by the fact that I was doing design work and I was very reliant on others uh, to design the controls for me. Um, at that time in the late 70s, uh, we were fortunate into having um, uh, uh, good mentors, uh, still very uh, traditional in engineering practice. So my mentor had 15, 20 years of background and uh, had, if you looked at, at the drawings that, that he did back in the 60s, um, they had controls design on the drawings. Engineers were very active in the construction administration phase. And basically, you know, I believe looking at it, I think there was a lot of self-commissioning by the design engineer back in, you know, before I got involved in, in our industry. Um, so I was, I was kind of a student of the controls design process and, and some of the problems with that at that time. Um, and then uh, after about nine years, and then I got to teach at the Air Force Institute of Technology and the old adage, you never learn things until you have to explain it to others is so true. Um, but I got to teach um, psychometrics and and hydronics and air system design, refrigeration, and so forth. And, um, you know, and I remember teaching 16, 17 hours of psychometrics in an applied HVAC design class. And, you know, we didn't get the psych chart out until I think hour seven or eight. We did everything by, by calculation. And I believe I grew up in a, a really good time frame where we did everything by hand. Um, and then we had uh, computer tools available to us, you know, in the 80s and 90s and today. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't grow up with uh, computer only tools or selection processes and tools and modeling and so forth. We had to do everything um, hard way and then tools just automated calculations. So I think it was a kind of a good time to, to grow up in engineering. Um, I was very anxious to get out of the government and into private practice because I was fairly convinced I was very myopic view of things that that uh, it was different in the outside. And I was very convinced that uh, it was something that the government was doing that in the way that we procured controls. Uh, and I was, uh, to be honest, quite shocked when I first worked. Uh, I, was, I worked for an early generation, what we call an ESCO back then that focused in hospitals. And um, these were private hospitals. They sole sourced everything, had relationships. There was no contracting challenges and it was eye-opening to see the same challenges uh, in, in critical facilities on the private side that I was seeing in my government experience. Um, and then um, a couple of years later, I decided I really wanted to do something different. Uh, and I wanted to basically do controls focused uh, engineering work or uh, you know, I, we actually wrote a business plan that said we wanted to be mechanical system advocates for owners working, making controls work well in critical facilities, something to that effect. And that was in 88, 89 timeframe. And then in, a couple of years later, we saw the world commissioning and we went, somebody named what we were trying to describe. <laughs> um, so I've stayed commissioning focused uh, and uh, commissioning centric and controls focused. And I do some master planning. I still do the teaching. I do the things I love. Um, and commissioning, uh, you know, kind of, I've, you know, early days, uh, 80s, 90s, um, were mostly focused on labs and, and uh, critical facilities. And it wasn't until really uh, lead came along and we started doing everything under the sun. Um, but our, our focus has been in, 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 in critical facilities, but, you know, we also have good exposure to just 
pretty plain vanilla buildings as well. So pretty good experience. I think it's somewhere in the 4,500 projects or something to that effect over the 30 years. Um, so, and, and they range from, you know, Apple Park and Google data centers to, you know, K through 12 and biosafety labs and everything in between libraries, museums. So, you know, private government across the board. So a pretty good uh, view of the world uh, on that background. So that's kind of my, my background. So, you know, and if I have a bias, I guess it is toward the inheritor side of the world. I think, you know, as a commissioning, I think you're supposed to look at things from whoever this is going to be turned over to. Um, throughout my career, it's been focused on energy engineering. And in the early days, it was pretty easy to, to uh, get energy savings, performance, improved performance, because we were pretty much constant volume, everything, a lot of reheat, things ran 24 um, seven. So it was, uh, it was pretty easy to, to meet whatever goals were out there. Um, we were involved in the very early pneumatics to DDC transition. And of course, it wasn't pneumatics to DDC. It was pneumatics to uh, automation overlays on top of pneumatics and then to early generation DDC. And then you can pick a number how many generations of DDC there's been over the years, but there's probably been at least three or four major uh, transitions in that arena. Um, and I was very uh, aware early on the on the typical controls design process or lack thereof. Um, again, this is not a new challenge that we've had, um, but uh, you know, back in you know my first design jobs in you know seventy nine eighty time frame, we still were performance specifying things with assistance of the vendors only dealing with pneumatics and and a lot of times uh, hasn't changed much. Um, something I've been keenly aware of as I look at projects with multiple energy projects on them or I see failed energy projects or things not performing like they they on I, I asked that question there on how many times do we get to claim the same BTU savings? Um, I'm afraid if I went back to where I started, I would find a building that's been there for you know 45 years, and we probably, I bet you I can find systems where we claim the same BTU savings four or five times. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you can make the argument that if you lost it, you still can generate the project for a new project to save it again. But I think there ought to be a limit or we ought to shoot for a limit on how many times we get to do the same, you know, same thing over and over again. You know, I put a time clock on a air handler way back when, and somebody took the pins out and somebody, did another project, put them back. And then somebody came in and put a DDC system because the pins were gone again. And then somebody did a retro commissioning job to uh, come in and, and uh, put justify DDC because the system ran 24 seven and, and so forth and so on. Um, I think many of you probably have seen projects like that. And that was just a simple example, but there are other more complex examples that I see that, uh, that don't persist and, and, and hence the problem. Um, one of the, since we have uh, researchers on here, and I'd love to I'd love to know this answer to this. Is some study, if somebody calculated the sum total of all the benefits, all the energy savings of all the energy projects we've done, and figure out how much savings we really were supposed to get versus what we really got. Now, you're never going to be able to work at it on a on a micro basis, but if you looked at a macro basis of all the projects, it'd be interesting to see what the so-called total savings are we had and supposedly are persisting. And uh, we might find out we should be consuming a lot less power in this country if they were all performing well. Um, that's just a thought. Um, and then, you know, so the, this persistence thing that I, I see throughout the projects, um, you know, I think it needs to influence a lot of different things, the concepts that are thought about and discussed, the engineering, the execution, and then the turnover to ultimately operations. Um, you know, I see really great concepts, really good en engineering. You know, in the commissioning world, you're kind of, you should be validating that execution. And there is a piece of, of good turnover. Um, I am seeing, um, over the last 30 years, especially in the last decade, as owners have gotten uh, more focused 
on commissioning and more used to what commissioning is, uh, I do see trends in universities and, and owners that have their own large facility staffs. They are paying more attention and paying more money in, in good turnover, good turnover documentation, um, training, involvement. And so there is a, an increased uh, awareness of turnover to staff is very, very key to that persistence nut. Um, operations wise, I mean, you know, we certainly have tools we're gonna, that we'll talk about um, that you've talked about in this, this meetings in, the, in this uh, conference. Uh, but I don't see any fundamental shift in how we operate buildings. Um, and, and then that led me to this commissioning world uh, where I spend an awful lot of my time. Uh, and uh, it's probably about 80% new construction and 20% retro commissioning. Um, and, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd do it the other way around. But the reality of it is just not that as much retro commissioning, um, you know, practical work to, to execute. And I think that's partly because it's hard to sort of scope. Uh, retro commissioning is naturally something that is uh, a little bit uh, more fluid in its, its scope of work because you really don't know how far you're going to have to go in a given building. Um, and then you've got your periodic continual commissioning, which led to you know fault detection analy uh, analytics and all that stuff. And the whole thing is, you know, we have things drift. We have entropy happens. Um, kind of my observations, and, and Marianne mentioned that uh, we've known each other um, uh, 20 years or so, but we first got to talk talking about fault detection. I think we actually developed uh, one of the, probably the first um, uh, commercial products years ago. Now we've gotten out of fault detection work because it's a different business model than commissioning, but um, it's an interesting story how we got into fault detection. We never really thought about it as a thing, but I mean, we, we, we actually had a software working uh, uh, for fault detection back in 98, 97, 98 timeframe. Um, we didn't ever hear the word analytics at that point in time, but the way we got into it was we had been commissioning for a state institution uh, in Virginia who, uh, was having us, um, uh, you know, come back. We did the natural off-season stuff. We found a lot of things overridden. Um, we corrected that during our off-season testing, and then they came back, and back in there we were dialing in to see things remotely, and they basically started to pay us periodically uh, kind of every couple of weeks to come in and uh, correct the drift, so to speak, and we were starting to think, well, that could be a – you know, potential regular business thing we do to, to help with persistence. Um, and then uh, my engineer had come to us and said, you know, I'm basically seeing the same things every time. I'm resetting this, it's getting overridden that way. And it became repetitive. And that was when the light bulb went on. It was like, we ought to be able to automate this. So that's how we got, we started our first foray into fault detection and we found some clients that wanted to were interested in sort of being a, a case study for that and we we played down that path um, now of course obviously there's a lot of thing and i'm a big believer in uh, it is a great tool i think it's a, a tremendous tool um but it's kind of interesting is that we didn't sit down and say we want to take advantage of the data we just actually logically we're seeing a repetitive thing occur and we said we ought to be able to automate that and that's kind of how we started on that path. Um, the other thing, uh, observation-wise, you know, is this controls design process um, that has been uh, slowly compromised over the years. Um, I think it's been pretty consistent. Uh, most recently, um, I, I it always bugged me that we 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 design systems and made sure we have enough capacity in the winter and the summer. And then we let things uh, during the uh, off, you know, during the, any other time we're not at full load, we rely on the controls and we really don't spend very much time designing that. It's always been a, 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 a hot button with me for, you know, 40 years and uh, it's no different today. Uh, and um, I, I think we ought to be able to do a better job designing our controls before we build that. 
Um, reality, that's going to be hard to do because our engineering industry is set up differently. And a lot of times we end up with things designed, built by control subcontractors. Um, commissioning being commonplace kind of can help that process. I think the best commissioning providers are um, quite control savvy and, and can insert themselves as certainly a selfish interest into nailing down um, control sequences so one can write their functional testing and so forth. Uh, but um, that's something I've been involved with. And then, you know, commissioning is a quality control process, uh, you know, that, that augments the, the traditional construction process. And um, I, I kind of, you know, look at quality control and safety over the years, again, being able to look good news, bad news, I can look back 40 years. Um, but I, I look at what happened, you know, as a young engineer, um, we really didn't have much of a quality control process 44 years ago. It was really, we had a couple inspectors show up and make sure things you know, worked. And we have probably a more active engineering present, somebody who um, followed the job from design through construction and, and was active uh, in balancing and the control setup and so forth. So quality control was done mostly with probably more active engineering in the field and more formal inspecting uh, inspection personnel uh, for the owners. That's changed over the 40 years. We, we spend a lot of money on quality. There's projects that have quality control managers, quality control teams, all through the system. We document stuff. We've got commissioning on top of that, making sure it happens. Um, but you know, if I look at the dollars that we spend on quality control versus what we got versus where we were 40 years ago, I, you know, it, it's, that's, I think it's a, not, a, not successful. Um, it's, it, it's sad uh, of how much money we spend on, supposedly spend on quality control and what we get based on my perspective. Um, but I compare that to safety and I look at a job site in 1978, safety wise, and they've job sites were not safe compared to today. We spend a lot more effort and money on safety over the 40 years to job sites today. And I, I think unequivocally our job sites are more safe. Um, so we've made tremendous strides in safety, quality control, you know, uh, not so much. Um, but a good commissioning process augments a lot of those issues, not the safety issue, but the controls design and the quality control process, and uh, that, that helps. Um, so where are we now and where do we go from here? Um, our focus in, in, in a lot of your talks at this conference and a lot of talks I see at national conference for sustainability, decarbonization, more efficient systems, net zero analytics and FDD, all good things. Um, we have cities and corporations and government entities committing to very, very aggressive goals um, in, in all of the above. Uh, and, and again, all this is, is really good stuff and um, it's, it's helpful. Um, a lot of energy codes and mandates, required systems and incentives, most of them you know, helping the whole process. Some of them a little bit misguided and there's some unintended consequences of things. Um, I, I personally have looked at, uh, at some things. I, I look at the whole I haven't worked in Hawaii the last 25 years. I've looked at energy's costs in Hawaii as they, they, uh, they used to, to really mirror the cost of oil almost identically. And about three or four years ago, they started to diverge. Uh, and, and mainly it's because we've got so much you know, PV installed in Ireland and, and basically the infrastructure costs are now uh, you know, significant. And so we have a divergence where you know, oil comes down and energy stays up and oil. And now we're, I think on island, the average, I was thinking about 37 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so kind of interesting how sometimes it, some things change there, but um, you know, what's missing? You know, what are we gonna do to main, mandate, you know, good operations and, 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 and persistence? Because I think that's, that's one of the things in all these goals that we're missing. I look at some of these, you know, some of the smaller cities that are committing to net zero in the next, you know, two to three decades and talking about private investments in a small city of, you know, you know, 
700 million dollars or something to get everything up to snuff and i read a lot of investment side on new systems and updated this and i you know i don't read too much about the what are we going to change in the operations of our systems what's going to change there so you know kind of this leads me to some thoughts on challenges that i see out there um, and I, I see a lot of design solutions um, don't typically consider the ultimate inheritors of the system. Um, you know, life cycle costing, we all know what that is, but I need, I think it needs to include a better, uh, a realistic uh, reality of what the operational requirements are for performance. If we put a system in that has a lot more sensors that need a lot more calibration. Um, even if we put an FDD tool on it that points out things and makes it easier, as Bob was saying, you know, it's good, we got to act on it. Well, even if there's a desire to act, but there's not the staff, um, we don't have the people. Um, you know, it could be not a lack of desire or, or, or knowledge, but it might not be the right solution for the system. Uh, I mean, for that particular uh, product. Um, you know, some great energy solutions, some great complex sequences may not be appropriate for the institution because they don't have the manpower or the personnel or the the skill sets uh, necessary uh, to keep things you know uh, working the way they should you know we've got to do some failure analysis hey what if things drift how does it perform or so basically look at the natural drift and consider that in the decisions that we make um and that leads me to the kind of op the typical operations paradigm we have out there obviously there's a whole bunch of different ways that people handle their facilities but in general looking at staffs that i've worked with across the universities public private um institutions and how they're maintained the you know do they rely on service they do it different ways uh, and generally, I, I can't say, I, I think in almost all cases, there's a lack of quantity and quality of, of, of skilled personnel on the owner side. Um, and I, I like to use the IT versus HVAC controls comparison. I, I actually did a presentation for, for APA 15 years ago where I compared IT systems at a university versus DDC infrastructure at a same university. And I a lot of diagrams look a lot alike and I grab some programs out of an IT system and grab some programs on out of a central plant and put those up and compared them and then compared the budgets for IT at a university with versus budget for controls operations and maintenance and then looked at the organizations for IT and the organizations for BAS at an institution and you're talking differences of two or three orders of magnitude difference in, in dollars and 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 people um and it's you know not that they're the same but i don't i think two or three orders of magnitude is a problem um and then the talent generation how do we if you waved a magic wand and everybody uh, realized they need better people more higher quality where do we generate that talent and that's you know again this organization uh, has done, you know, remarkable things in that arena, uh, you know, just looking at the programs that I've been exposed to through the various uh, institutions. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, you know hand, hats off to what, what's been done in that arena. But, you know, we're right now in, in this giant resource challenged arena where everyone is competing for the same resources. And, you know, this education challenge, as you all are, some of the people on this call are keenly aware of, um, you know, where does the talent go? Um, you know, who consumes the really good talent? And, you know, it's some of it is a financial reality. Who's who can pay the most for those folks? And in general, it's mostly, you know, the controls vendor manufacturers, installer service companies are the ones that probably can do best. Now, there's been a little switch in the last few years, and it's, it's the commissioning side of the thing. Prior to commissioning becoming a, 
a common practice, most people who had controls um, skills either worked for a, a vendor, installer, manufacturer, or worked for an owner. Uh, consulting engineers certainly could use the skill set. I don't see them being as big consumer, but they ought to be. Um, but the commissioning is a big thing uh, because commissioning providers and controls companies usually can pay the salaries, the higher salaries versus an owner. So an owner is, a, is typically disadvantaged uh, from a, the financial reality of what they can pay or what they traditionally pay. And again, I'm using a lot of generalities or exceptions to this all over the place, but that's kind of what I see. Um, so some of the ideas or thoughts or things to try to prevent, you know, just, or to promote a little bit discussion here are, you know, what are the, I, I think we need metrics out there to ensure per, persistence. In other words, not just a metric based on um, you know, a temporary performance. It needs to be more of a permanent performance. In other words, I, I don't see the motivation other than the organizations on their own realizing it, that they do that. And I did, I did get exposed to some institutions that use CO2 kind of as a, in hard terms, not adjusted as a metric. Uh, and then energy becomes persistent energy performance becomes key if you're using kind of a hard CO2 number, non-adjustable as sort of your, your target. Um, and my other kind of thing is FDD. Um, I mean, personally, I think where FDD is its most valuable, in my opinion, is on new buildings, brand new, perfectly working buildings. In other words, applying them to a building that is working perfectly. In other words, keep entropy at bay. Um, to me, you, if somebody's got a building working really well, whether it was retro commissioned or whether it was new construction, um, I think that's really where it's, it's very easy to install and set up as part of a, a new construction. And um, basically it's, it's running from day one. And uh, at that point in time, you're not looking at hundreds of faults, You're, you should see start with no faults and then basically catch the drift, and it becomes, you know, one or two items periodically versus just overwhelming amount of faults uh, that can occur. So I, that's just something. I, of course, you know, somebody said, "Well, what's the payback?" Well, the payback is zero at the beginning, but the payback is really to, again to keep that persistence. Um, so I think goals and mandates need to include a focus on some measurable continual performance over time, not just a year or off season, you know, many years. Um, and then design needs to look more at life cycle costs and again, in a serious manner and consider the operational realities of an organization. Sometimes the perfect solution or the best energy solution is not the best for that particular owner and their ability to service it. Uh, so so I, I, a lot of times I would rather settle for a 90 to 95% of, of perfection solution if it's an order of magnitude simpler and has the capability of persisting. And I don't think that that analysis happens enough. Um, and again, how do we motivate you know, better operations of, uh, and I'm talking the quantity and quality of people. And the, these are things that, you know, that some of the things I'm listing here are things that, you know, we've got to make it important to make these fundamental changes. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take time. And then one of the other things I always talk about or think about is, is some, even if we get the people in there, how do we keep them in there? Um, and, and the, the last bullet there is to say, you know, we need a technical track for high-end systems professionals so that they can uh, grow professionally and financially and stay technical. Um, most of our organizations, if somebody wants to grow professionally and financially, they have to leave the tech, they have to leave technical uh, details and, and have to work, move into management. So, and that's a natural thing that people will want to going to do for themselves and their, and their family. Um, 
And I, I, I do, again, I, I throw these things out there. This is for food for thought, but it's the whole idea is to like, how do we, how do we motivate that to happen? Um, there are people who are really, really good at dealing with systems and troubleshooting and logical thinking and controls. And they just are great at fixing things. Um, and maybe they're not such a great manager, um, but boy, do we need that skill set, um, especially in our, in our buildings. Um, and how do, we, how do we allow that to stay there and have people grow? Um, you know, I, I see this focus on, on first, co- you know, on projects, on, you know, the shiny object thing, capital projects, you know, we'll spend a million dollars on a, on a, you know, something quote unquote green or whatever. Um, but, you know, and it'll have a, a savings and a payback and maybe it's a little longer than normal, but, you know, that same institution, if I could take a 10th of that money and I could upgrade three positions from $80,000 a year positions to $120,000 positions. And what I could do with those three people of, of really high skilled running around that institution, um, I could make a really a much bigger difference than I could on 10 times the money uh, on a shiny object on a, on a project. Um, those are the things that I think that we need to look at. Um, and this last slide I have in here is just some sort of discussions and thoughts. And, and again, it's we're not in a, a mechanism to really sort of have an open discussion. Um, but you know, the questions are how do, how do we motivate um, our design, construction, operation, or energy efforts to focus on this long-term, consistent, robust performance over longer periods of time? I mean, I think that really needs to be some of the focus of some of our, our goals, our mandates, our, our, our corporate initiatives that are out there. Um, and how do we change the current operational approach to increase that quality and quantity, and quantify, quanti- quantity of inheriting personnel? So um, I think there's both a, a quality and a number of people. I don't know of any organizations that are flush uh, with people in, in operations. Um, and again, this is more in your sweet spot. The next one, yours, those who are on the education side here is how do we continue to prepare these per- people for these in- increased uh, requirements and needs? Um, that's always going to be a challenge. It's not going to happen overnight that there's going to be this, this uh, 50% increase in demand. I think we're already shorting these, these people. And you know, I, I truly believe the commissioning industry having a need, it's a new need for this person. Um, I think we're kind of making the shortage worse because it's we're, we're basically a new avenue. I know that in our particular case, we've probably hired 30 or 40 people over the years from the controls industry. Um, so the people who were in the controls industry, very talented people, now they're on the commissioning side. You know, what replaces them? You know, and uh, owners are in a worse condition because they don't have quite the ability to pay for those individuals. And then the last question I had just as a thought there is, is again, I, I come back to how, do, how does our maintenance and operations of our energy systems or mechanical electric system building compare with other critical system operations? Again, like IT, and, and, and I like analogies, but I mean, you know, our energy system operations is energy performance. It's our comfort in our buildings, heating and cooling. There's some safety aspects in critical facilities. There's air quality. All those kind of things, you know, are all good in a well-run building. Um, you know, if we compare that to IT world, um, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of, I, I don't think, you know, we won't tolerate a slow, unreliable network that's not secure. Um, but so we've done things in the IT world to make that fast and secure and reliable. And if you looked at the energy performance and how well we serve our customers, I, I don't think we, we, meaning the facility management organizations of the world really put the same effort. Now IT systems didn't even exist 30 years ago, really the IT management budgets at a, at a Berkeley. I mean, but I mean, 
You could look at the own university and look at the dollars and cents that are spent on IT infrastructure and the personnel and the directors and the how much it is there. And it, it's eye-opening to how much is there compared to what's on the equivalent. And, and, and the bottom line is we don't, I don't think we're serious about valuing our HVAC performance, our energy performance, our indoor air quality, because we don't put, we don't, we're literally orders of magnitude off uh, a level of effort. And that's just, again, I, I uh, at 44 years in the business, you get to, you get to have a, have perspective and, and speak your mind. So I, I think Peter invites me, you know, kind of, uh, not, you know, these are just, this is just my perspective. Um, and uh, I'd love to see some changes in this area over the next decade or two. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jay. Uh, I invite our participants to put uh, questions and comments in, in the chat or in the Q&A for Jay and to kind of get this phase started. Jay, could you comment a little bit on complexity and how the complexity of these systems has evolved over time and are, is the proliferation of sensors, the uh, complexity of sequences of operations um, and what kind of demands are those changes or that evolution putting on the operation side, on the building technicians. And is BAS helping? Is it reducing complexity or increasing complexity well, for the technician? Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm a proponent of, I mean, certainly designing detailed control sequences. I'm, you know, purveyor of, of, of certainly more complex systems, but I, I, I don't think we need to, I, th I don't think we, we can turn a blind eye to the reality of it. So there's certainly sequences that I would have put in some places that I wouldn't put it in because the only way that sequence will work is if this thing is regularly calibrated, uh, and I never and it's and it's not calibrated. I mean, it's just not it's not there. Um, so I don't you know. So I step back. Um, there's cases that I've actually done sequences where I put the more complex logic and sort of disabled it so that if things change, um, they could they get both sequences. They get one a little bit simpler and they get the logic for the more complex one in case somebody comes in and say, ah, oh, no, we can handle that more complex one and they can move over to it. Um, I, I think, you know, the, I think the, the adage that I use is, you know, a, a good BAS system could be, uh, you know, a great tool and a, and a poor one can be an Achilles heel. So in, to answer your question, does it add to or subtract from? Um, so, it depends, or it's a universal consultant answer. Of, you know, depends on the situation, um, but uh, I think that I, I think that in general, I think BAS DTC helps us a lot because you know your precursor to that is pneumatics and distributed controls, and you didn't have the visibility. It's just you know uh, didn't didn't have the the same opportunities. We've got a couple of questions and comments in the chat, um, including Roberts, uh, about sort of the premise of what what the is the owner really choosing uh, not to value the operations of buildings, partly because air is invisible, uh, you know, or and everybody's using the IT system, but they're 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 not directly connected to the HVAC system. Uh, it's an interesting comment, I think. How do how do we? And, and it begs the question: How do we move the perception of air quality and comfort and those relationships to productivity to heighten the importance and and recognition of the building technicians? You know, it's kind of interesting in that 40 years perspective, I mean, there was no attention. If I look at how much effort is put in, I, I, you know, just picking since my ground zero was a military base where it was an extra duty. Today I go to another military base and they have a full-time energy manager and, you know, four or five resource 
energy resources that they contract for. And so they've, you know, ridiculous amount of manpower, you know, they've got, you know, projects funded through ESCOs and so forth. So a whole bunch of focus, um, but I still see some of the, some of the basic challenges. I, I have need, I've seen changes on, on that side of it, but I've seen no changes on the, you know, the operations staff is still over here. Of course, mil, you know, the government went through sort of all this, you know, best value stuff and, you know, outsource maintenance and sort in-house and all that stuff. So there's just this dollars and cents thing that, you know, how can we maintain this stuff the cheapest? And, it, and so, um, you know, in, in your first question, you know, is the owner, uh, owner being at a disadvantage or choosing to be a disadvantage, I, I, you know, that's a, it, it's a, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> and, and the answer is yes, <laughs> I think. Um, there, there, or maybe it's an ostrich syndrome, right? They're just, you know, it's too hard to get your arms around. So I don't know how to solve it. Um, again, if you had owners all, you know, again, my, magic wand, they all got you know, religion and realize is a big problem. The, the supply demand, there's not enough supply out there of, of the people they want. So, um, you know, it, luckily it's not going to happen overnight because they would, they wouldn't be able to find the people. But I think it's a general, I think the, the most we can hope for is a better awareness and maybe we can set up metrics to somehow motivate owners to say, okay, if I'm going to hit these metrics, I, and I'm going to do this seven year payback project. I mean, it's got to persist for the seven years to make it economically viable. What happens is, you know, they lose the savings, entropy of hers. And now I can make an argument that if the savings don't persist, you're better off had done nothing or put your money somewhere else. I see too many projects that just decay very rapidly. I see it in new construction commissioning. I come back for the off season testing four, five, six months later, and it's incredible what's been, what happened in six months, not just to the things that we're looking at, it's just the normal operations decay very rapidly in some places. And again, I think FDD and stuff like that will help that. Um, but. Uh, interesting comment from Robin uh, McClellan in upstate New York here, suggesting that there's an imbalance between the HVAC technology and the BAS systems, uh, that the BAS systems uh, are more effective than the, than the mechanical systems they're controlling. Any comment on that, Jay? Um, I, again, depends on the systems. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, obviously, if we look at it, our, in our industry over those 40 some years, I mean, uh, you know, chillers are still chillers and pumps are still pumps and fans. Our systems are, yeah, we can put them together in different uh, ways. We have fan walls. We never had fan walls. I mean, we have some new things, but controls like, oh my goodness. I mean, you know, we were dealing with pneumatics and now we have, you know, we can, you know, I can respond to alarm on my smartphone. I mean, I can see things here. We didn't have, you know, phones. We didn't know what we were dealing with in that arena. So there's been, we've had quantum leaps in controls. So in general, yeah, I think our controls have this sophistication that's necessary uh, to do a lot of uh, uh, things in our systems. It's, it's really just picking, I, I think, again, we need, to, we need to look at the right systems for the, for the right application. Um, and sometimes we're motivated to do things that on paper look really good because we meet some energy calculation, model, goal, percentage, whatever, to meet something and it may or may not be the right solution. Um, so. Uh, Uh, Mark raises an interesting point uh, from Delaware, talking about the perception of facility well, separation. Hi, yeah. Mark. <laughs> um, we know each other. Ah, the uh, something that the Best Center has tracked a lot, and and 
look to see if, if it would get any traction is the relationship between occupant comfort and productivity. And obviously companies spend a lot of money on personnel. And as you have suggested, they spend very little on operations of the building in which people are, are expected to function. Um, we've looked at that 330, 300 model that JLL put forward at, at some point. We're just not seeing much uh, consistent focus on productivity and the importance of, of occupant comfort in, in promoting productivity. Even the studies about temperature control uh, for different people in the building. Uh, do you see any any sign that this this will unfreeze? And we'll start? No, I, you know, and I, I, I agree with Mark completely. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's again, it's just it's an overhead number. It's a bucket. They have metrics that they follow. We spend this amount of money, and and there's nobody pushing it for more unless unless an owner is adapting a change. And we we again we had an institution who is focused on CO2 footprint and then energy savings and persistent energy savings became critical. Um, and there was serious money spent on energy projects and persistent energy and projects and FDD and everything else to ensure that entropy doesn't drift. So. I, and again, that's right. I, I mean, we've got to, you know, what's the motive? I mean, that's the question that I'm throwing out for discussion and thought to a lot of people in, in you know, over listening and say, you know, we, I think we all, I think everybody, we have a lot of bobblehead stuff. You know, everybody kind of agree. Yeah, this is a problem, but how do we, how do we change it? That's to me, the big question. Um, you know, I'm an empirical learner. Um, but I'm not sitting, I don't run a facility or I don't know, I don't own a building. I don't own a facility. I, I work with people who own them. Um, and, it, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, yeah, I mean, Jennifer just asked about with a mass exodus of, of commercial buildings with how is there, I, I think it's too early to tell what, what happens in that. I haven't, I, I probably spend le less time in the commercial office space than I do in institutional industrial space. Um, so I think a jury's still out on that. Um, but, you know, the only motivation I've seen is when metrics were tied to some longer term goal. Um, so if we can, if we, and maybe it needs to be other softer metrics, I mean, you know, CO2 or footprint, uh, you know, that's a hard one. Um, that's a hard metric. But I mean, there's also some of the things mentioned earlier about the, you know, quality, you know, or, you know, comfort and, and everything else in their building and air quality and so forth. Um, you know, those all need to be have a metric. I mean, again, going back to the IT, we have some very clear, you know, you, you, you use an IT system, you know, if it's slow, you know it, you're, you're going to complain if it's unreliable, if it's not there and it's supposed to be, it's a problem. Um, those are the metrics in that world. And in most places, we now have gotten to the point where, you know, we're used to that. We're, we're intolerant of anything that's not fast or reliable or secure. Um, in buildings, we kind of, you took the average building occupant, they're used to, be, you know, they're used to being uncomfortable or, and they have no real view of what the energy performance of their buildings is. Nobody really knows whether an energy project is working. Um, but from an owner user perspective, um, you, you know, Jay, in some of our previous discussions, we talked about business models and the business models, the business model of a particular entity drives its behavior. Um, in this arena, Jennifer mentions that building owners are not the end users quite often, what, uh, in changing the metrics of building operations, of course, the business model itself would have to change to a certain extent. 
there would have to be more focus on productivity or more understanding of, of productivity. And I, I think you're right. A lot of people just suffer through their experience in buildings and buy a, an, an extra heater, uh, do whatever they have to do to, to maintain some level of comfort so that they can be productive because uh, depending on the gender of the, the individual, we know from studies, for example, that different genders perform better at different temperatures. Um, and, and, and that was a big reveal in the last few years, but it's something that should have been obvious all along, but you know, can, is, is there any way of changing those metrics? You know, I don't. Know. I mean, that's what that's that's what you know. People who live in this world, you know, can 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 kick around. But I I just don't see any this. I, I see the focus on the front end side. I see the focus on you know getting rid of natural gas in the cities and, and decarbon, you know, net zero and all this stuff. And I see no discussion on changing the turnover to you know the operational side. And we have a huge nut out there that if we could improve that. It would just lower the bar on the front side, but we're no, not even going to pay attention to that. Um, and that's that's I guess that's that's my point. So I think today there's more of an awareness of energy conservation, performance, and air quality than there was. I mean, in again that forty year perspective, you know, if you talk to energy performance or you know, global, you know, any kind of, you know, it's bad because it's bad for the, I mean, there was no bad for the planet back then. Um, you know, but at least there's to it, whether you're a tenant or anybody, there's at least an awareness that wasting energy is not a good thing. I think we're, we're, we're queued up to at least start having these discussions a little bit more fervently and and, and I'm just, I don't have the answers. I'm just posing the questions. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, again, my goal here was to provoke thought and, and thinking of, of a wide range of people with different backgrounds. Um, I've got no agenda here at all other than to, you know, this is, you know, if this doesn't change, you know, from a business perspective, I have plenty of business, but I, I, I shouldn't, I've had customers uh, where we've retro commissioned a quarter of their facility for four years and then we're, we're good. And they said, oh, no, no, fifth year, you got to come back and do the first quarter again because they're going to be all screwed up already. And like, that's wrong. You know, that's not what you're, because in the retro commissioning we happen to be doing at this particular site, you know, you're, you're also engaging the operations, training, documenting so that it does persist. But there's just not enough of the people who are there, or you get a turnover, or one key person leaves, and and then you're back at square one again. Um, it's, I mean, we we in the engineering commissioning any of the trade side, we um, we enjoy uh, fixing things, making things work better. It doesn't matter whether it's an air handler, a chiller, or a dishwasher, or a lawnmower. I mean, we still like doing that. I mean, so we, but the idea would be to kind of not have to do the same thing over and over again. Um, and how do we, how do we do that? And that's, that's really the, the, the thought process here. Um, and again, I, I pick on the IT because that's something that didn't even exist at our campuses, say, or our large institution 30 or 40 years ago. It came out of nowhere and we figured out how to make it work pretty well. You know, we didn't do it with, you know, a couple people working on the side, keeping it up and running. We have a department. I don't know what your department at Berkeley is, but I bet you it's a hundred people and headed by somebody making a lot more than the head of the control shops making. Yeah. Jay, one, one final thought and, and, we're we're approaching a break time, or actually into a break. But um, do you see any difference in on the operation side in areas where where the services are outsourced or or held in house? 
and do you see much uh, what what trend do you see there and and is, does it make any difference i i haven't seen a difference i mean if anything i i i don't know i think i've I've, I don't have enough data to data points or their personal experiences. Um, and they, you know, some, sometimes when they've outsourced it, maybe they save money, but I've seen the, a degradation of infrastructure. I mean, you know, if you go to another good question, I probably should have thrown it down on the slide here uh, is, is, you know, de, you know, in that IT comparison um, is, is, you know, if you went to the, to, to Berkeley or any university, you say, you know, what's your deferred maintenance backlog for things that need to be fixed? And it's, it's like, yeah, we got a five year, 10, you know, ridiculous amount of deferred maintenance we haven't gotten to. If you go to the IT organization and said, how much deferred maintenance do you have in your IT system? Oh, we got this patch and this thing and that, and we've got a couple old routers we want to, I mean, it's, just that doesn't exist so why do we have so much deferred maintenance out there you know yeah. it's the first thing you look at in a retro commissioning job is okay i want to you know i know this control system is is the sequence is bad i need to improve it but oh yeah the you know the valve leaks and the dampers linkage is messed up and i knew dampers are rusted you know okay i can't even begin on the improving the performance of the system until I fix the things that are broken. Right. I've seen this at hospitals and across the boards, not just institutions, uh, universities. See it in more critical facilities as well. A lot of economizers that aren't working. Well, that's always a challenge, but um, yeah, again, it shouldn't, it's one thing it's not working because you know a sequence is overridden or a sensor's out of whack. It's a whole nother thing when you know a damper's stuck, you know, and hadn't moved for years. Um, but and again, that's again, it's not like that everywhere. It's just it's just too much of it. You know, I, I've seen places where institutions were looking to put it, you know, or actively putting in FDD you know, to identify problems in the building, you walk in a mechanical room and their humidifiers are, you know, uh, you know, in the corner disassembled. The FDD will show that, hey, you're not meeting humidification. Yeah, I didn't need that to tell me that. I need to walk in the room and says it's broken in the corner. So, I mean, it's cart before the horse there in that particular case, but, you know, again, it's not, I'm a proponent of FDD. Don't, I'm not, I'm just saying that, we need to prioritize the things. Yeah. Just a, a final thought, and and uh, people can should go to break very quickly. <clears throat> but in terms of data and the ability of a building to generate data that should improve operations, any final thoughts about that? I mean. Buildings have become data warehouses, but mm -hmm. are they information warehouses? Do they generate uh, actionable information? I, I think our, I think our, I, I've watched the evolution of our FDD tools over the last couple of decades, and I think they've gotten to the point where we are discriminating. We're not just flushing out there might be a problem. We're actually being able to interpret the data and realizing the data may not be all accurate, and we have to take that into consideration, but I think our tools are being are better uh, to point us in the right direction. And there's there's the fault side of it, but there's also the information on, you know, if you, a building knows an awful lot. I mean, if you've had, if you're in a building and you've had, you know, 10 or 20 design days over the last five years, um, that's a useful piece of information if you come into changing out a system when you say, okay, you know, do I go back and do a load calculation? Or maybe I ask the building, how much do you really need? Building knows the answer. I mean, if, 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 if you look at the data and you find that none of the variable speed drives went full speed over, you know, multiple design days, that kind of is a, a sign there. None of the chill water valves were open uh, fully or what, I mean, there's information or the opposite, struggling all the time. Um, 
there's a, a lot of data in there, not so much on, on faults, but just on system sizing issues. And there's also can be some pretty good obvious indication in the data on sort of utilization of systems. So yeah, I think it is more just in faults. I think it's, it's information that we ought to be collecting and there's really no reason why we shouldn't today. The data sizes we're talking about are, are minute in the scale of, of what we're talking about. Um, and we have the network speeds and we have the, we have the, the, the capacity to store the information because the information is small, it's tiny compared to what we're doing right now with 100 people on you know, video bandwidth that you know, we, we get at our home. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I think we'll, we'll close and let people take a quick break before our next session starts. Um, we do have uh, a chat function. Um, Kim, if you're there, could you come on and explain how, you know, if Jay, are you able to, to hang around a little bit longer if people have other questions? Sure, I, I'm, I'm available. And, and uh, not quite sure, uh, I, I suppose if, if we can keep this room open in, for another five minutes or so, and then if you want to pose questions to Jay, please do. And um, most people are still here, so nobody's leaving. Jay, I don't. Um, no problem. No, I'd be glad to. So any other final questions for Jay? OK. And we will uh, make Jay's uh, PowerPoint available, and you will be able to view uh, the, the video of this. Um, day one and day two videos are already posted in the, um, in, the, in the auditorium. And this one will be posted by tomorrow, I suspect. So you'll be able to come back and, and, and view it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna end the session and and make the transition. Thank you so much, Jay. Okay, no time. problem, Peter. Okay. Never mind. All right. Have a good one.